Thoughts and ideas, images, form the background of our minds. It's almost like the walls of the room. But what is up in our face constantly are our feelings. And the feelings are like a little dog or like children. They're right up in your face always, making their demands and letting their presence be felt. And that's why, as I said earlier, we normally we don't ask, what are you thinking today, but uh, what are you how are you feeling? Uh, feelings are the interface between the will and the, and the rest of the person and the, and the world. Um, and one of the great tragedies is a will that becomes entangled with feelings and desire. By feelings, by the way, I mean both desires, emotions, and sensations, all of those. It's a very ill-defined group of things, but you always know them when you've got them because, as I say, they come right up there and grab you. And, uh, and again, this is partly due to the fact that our minds are so small that we need things that will guide us. Uh, even something as anger, which can be so very dangerous, is a vital function of the human self. It has to be carefully controlled, like any emotion, because feelings uh, are, generally speaking, they're good servants, but horrible masters. And we have to be very careful with them and not allow them to become confused with the will. Um, another thing we need to say about them is they can't be mastered head on. Uh, you cannot overcome or handle feelings just by dealing with them directly. Basically, you deal with your feelings through your thoughts and also the dispositions of the body, but we'll come to that later. You can change your feelings by changing your thoughts, but you can't change your thoughts by changing your feelings. There's some connection, but it's not direct. But if you take the Word of God into your mind, for example, and allow it to inhabit you, you'll find your feelings transformed. For example, it's almost impossible for a person to remain depressed in the ordinary sense, perhaps, not clinical depression, but uh, just discouragement. It's almost impossible to remain discouraged and to read the Psalms out loud. Try it, you'll see. Uh, it's just amazing. And for example, if a person is worried about something and can't sleep, well, just get up and read the Psalms. Read them out loud. Perhaps read them while walking about. Perform them. Put them into your body. And you'll find that that changes feelings. But you cannot handle feelings head on and one of the greatest illusions of human life. One reason why it remains so messed up is because people try to deal with them head on. And now that's whether, you know, it's uh, alcoholism or something like that or anger. Uh, I see in families, for example, anger uh, just gets out of control involves contempt, wrath, bodily harm, all these things. And, and the people involved really never wanted that. But you see, they tried to deal with their feelings by direct force of will, and you cannot do it. You have to learn other ways of dealing with them. Another thing we have to understand is that feelings, they're nearly always self-justifying and, and you, you really have to approach feelings in a similar way that I mentioned with thoughts. You have to want to feel what you're not now feeling and to want not to feel what you are feeling. And feelings just are so prevailing, you know. Just like anger. I, you hear people talk about self-righteous uh, indignation. I've never seen any unrighteous indignation. Right? It's always righteous. And feelings, feelings are like that. An idea that comes to you always comes with a question, you know, well, is that justified? You can get very attached to them, but feelings always come with saying, I'm justified. I'm, it's right that I should be here. And that's one reason why they're so powerful and so seductive. Another thing we need to be, uh, say about our feelings is that our identity is not in our feelings. And of all things in our culture, that is one of the hardest things for us to get down. Our identity is not in our feeling, it's in our character. But people identify themselves with their feelings. And there's so many illustrations, if we, if we had time, we could go into uh, having to do with sexuality or uh, masculinity or whatever. Uh, feelings are brought to the front. and that feeling then is cultivated. And uh, one of the things we need to say also about feelings is never try to cultivate feelings. Cultivate thoughts and then cultivate habits 
and let the feelings follow along after you. See, if I identify myself with my feelings, then I will do whatever is necessary to protect them. And I'm sure you know, as I certainly know, many people who are locked into that as a life course, protecting their feelings, justifying their feelings, making sure that everyone understands how they feel about it. Let me tell you how I feel about this, right? And uh, often you want to say, you know, it really doesn't matter very much. Now, if you're, if you're doing therapy or something of that sort, you, you do take the feelings very seriously. But at some point we need to say, you know, there's much more to us than our feelings. And our feelings come and go. They're not good guides to life. We need to understand the truth about ourselves and about God and act on that, and then our feelings will come along afterwards. And we're not talking about repression or denial. I think repression and denial are always harmful. Sometimes it may be necessary just to deal with the situation we're in. We're talking about, for example, not being angry, not repressing or denying it, but living with a vision of God which allows me to not be an angry person. See, I'm, not, I'm talking about not being lustful, not being covetous. See. And if we have heard the gospel and begun to enter through the presence of the Spirit and the Word in our lives, this process of transformation, we can actually come to the point to where we're not governed by anger. We're not governed by covetousness, desire, envy, and all those other really poisonous feelings. You know, addiction which we have such trouble with, and not just today, but it's a human problem, is always a matter of deciding to allow your feelings a place in your life that they don't deserve. Addiction is always, you know, it's a consent to satisfy those feelings. Uh, and as long as we feel they must be satisfied, we are their captive. And there will be a point at which they will have control of us. And they will always pull us out of domination by the positive feelings associated with love, joy, and peace. You see, what we want is those feelings to come from the Word and the Spirit into our lives so that they even possess our bodies. You know, if peace hasn't hit your body yet, it's got a way to go. If joy hasn't hit your body yet, if love hasn't, then see it has a way to go. Uh, we want to come to the place to where those positive feelings, and I do have to add, love, joy, and peace aren't just feelings. They're conditions of the self that have positive feelings with them. Uh, and that can be misleading because then you try to make yourself feel joyful instead of being joyful. Feel loving instead of being loving feel peaceful. And do you know where that will always lead? Addiction of one form or another because you're going for the feeling. I want to be loving when I don't feel loving. I want to be joyful when I'm in pain. I want to be at peace when I'm struggling with things. And that's the nature of the spiritual life in Christ is to make that possible. And then these come with feelings that take over the whole self and their world. And we no longer have the negative feelings that are gnawing at us because we're being pulled by the positive vision of goodness in the kingdom of God that has love, joy, and peace at its front. And then, of course, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, all those other things come right along in its train. So I think that helps a lot, and I, this brings together that other aspect of the mind, which is emotion, um, because uh, when, we, when we bring the Word of God as a living substance into us, it really does change us. And, yeah. uh, and I think it changes, uh, my experience has been at the level of feeling. I still remember uh, teaching a woman once uh, as we drove along. I was in the front seat, she was in the back seat, and we, we went to the same church, and I was, I was going over Romans 8 about 
what shall separate us from the love of God? And suddenly it dawned on me what this all meant. Mm -hmm. And it's like the car was mm -hmm. filled with glory. <laughs> and and uh, that sense of being loved by God w was so profound and it affected me so deeply. I really was never the same after that in thinking mm -hmm. about the love of God and being loved of God. And then that, uh, see, I trace that back to the content of the thoughts. Yeah. Is it, that's what made the connection. And uh, when we are dealing with the cases like you mentioned, see, for, for me, that, again, that's emotion mm -hmm. loaded with a bunch of images. Mm -hmm. uh, and how, fool, how foolish he made me look, and so on. Yeah. I had to bring that over into the context of the content of the Word of God mm -hmm. and that, to see myself differently. And that, the, the word content there, let me just put in a little first grade level sentence that, um, that we're, we're not going to be able to chew on the Scripture unless we have some familiarity with it. I think mm -hmm. it would be good in, in small groups and different settings to realize that it's really important just to learn your Bibles, yeah. yes. just to kind of right. know. I, I knew the story of Jephthah. I knew where it was mm -hmm. in the book of Judges because when I was a kid, I was dragged to more churches <laughs> than I ever wanted to go to. And there's just a value to just knowing the Scripture. Mm -hmm. and, um, and even if it feels dry for the time, it's almost like a first-year medical student learning the bones and learning the chemicals. Eventually, it'll come in really, really handy. So I would like to make a plug for just Bible knowledge. This emotional thing, um, how emotions and thoughts are so interrelated. Um, again, it was very recently, maybe a couple weeks ago, that I was realizing an attitude in me toward my wife. She had not responded in a particular way that I mm -hmm. unconsciously was demanding she respond. Mm -hmm. And when she didn't, I felt somewhat justified in distancing myself from her. Um, and feeling that if she didn't respond a little differently, that I was really handling myself quite, um, quite honorably. Mm. And <laughs> at one point, I noticed the pain in her face, and I thought, no, I don't like producing pain in her. What, what's, mm -hmm. I don't know how to change all this. And I, I, I actually pondered the obvious Ephesians 5 passage about mm -hmm. love her the way the Lord loves me. And I just pondered that, just very simply. If, if, if he loves me the way I'm treating my wife, I'm in bad shape. <laughs> and there was a level of brokenness that developed in me that changed my feelings toward my wife. I was broken. I was repentant. Mm -hmm. I went and told her that. I felt warm toward her. I felt like the mm -hmm. biggest privilege I have in this life is having her for a wife. Yes. I just felt warm. It was yeah. wonderful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd love to think that will sustain itself for the rest of my life. Well, the good thing about these emotions is that they spread over they do. the life, don't they? They do indeed. And when I'm, indeed. when I'm in union with my wife at this deep level, mm -hmm. I'm in union with the world yes. in a different way. Yeah. And uh, conversely, if I, I know, I remember how not being in union with my wife would mm -hmm. affect our children. Oh. Mm -hmm. When I was in private practice and I would go to work every morning to see my seven or eight clients, um, my wife would, she would start laughing if she were here now because she knows a story I'm going to tell very briefly. Mm -hmm. The number of times I had to call her before I could start working with anybody and straighten mm -hmm. out something between my wife mm -hmm. and me mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I was of no use to people if I was at odds with my wife. The Germans recently made studies of this, you know, and found that men who kiss their wives in the morning have much lower blood pressure, fewer <laughs> heart attacks. Mm. Isn't that something? And something as simple as that. that. Mm. Yes, but that's the power of emotion. That's the power yeah. of the emotion. Yeah. Yeah, we need so to are, the, are the Germans doing that more now? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What My the wife will ask us to go to Germany if that's the case. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a powerful kind of thing. It really is.